This is the guy. I'm sorry to keep everybody waiting. 16 months ago, in April of 2023, I launched my campaign for president yeah. of the United States. I began this journey as a Democrat, the party of my father, my uncle, the party which I pledged my own allegiance to long before I was old enough to vote. I attended my first Democratic he convention some kind of shit at the age of six in 1960. Yeah. And back then, the Democrats were the champions of the Constitution, of civil rights. The Democrats stood against authoritarianism. Is he ill? No, he's not ill. Against censorship, against colonialism, imperialism, up. and unjust wars. We were the party of labor, of the working class. The Democrats were the party of government transparency and the champion of the environment. Our party was the bulwark against big money interests and corporate power. True to its name, it was the party of democracy. As you know, I left that party in October because it had departed so dramatically from the core values that I grew up with. It had become the party of war, censorship, corruption, big pharma, big tech, oh. big ag, and big money. When it abandoned democracy by canceling the primary to conceal the cognitive decline of the sitting president, I left the party to run as an independent. The mainstream of American politics and journalism derided my decision. Conventional wisdom said that it would be impossible even to get on the ballot as an independent because each state poses an insurmountable tangle of arbitrary rules for collecting signatures. I would need over a million signatures, something no presidential candidate in history had ever achieved. And then I'd need a team of attorneys and millions of dollars to handle all the legal challenges from the DNC. The, nader, the naysayers told us that we were climbing a glass version of Mount Impossible. So the first thing I want to tell you is that we proved them wrong. We did it because beneath the radar of mainstream media organs, we inspired a massive independent political movement. More than 100,000 volunteers sprang into action, hopeful that they could reverse our nation's decline. Many worked 10-hour days, sometimes in blizzards and blazing heat. They sacrificed family time, personal commitments and sleep month after month, energized by a shared vision of a nation mm. healed of its divisions. They set up tables at churches and farmers markets. They canvassed door to door. In Utah and in New Hampshire, volunteers collected signatures in snowstorms, convincing each supporter to stop in the frigid cold, to take off their gloves and to sign legibly. During a heat wave in Nevada, I met a tall athletic volunteer who cheerfully told me that he had lost 25 pounds collecting signatures in 117 degree heat. Yeah, I fucking bet that. To finance this effort, young Americans donated their lunch money and senior citizens gave up their part of their social security checks. Our 50 state organization collected those millions of signatures and more. No presidential campaign in his political, American political history has ever done that. And so I want to thank all of those dedicated volunteers and congratulate the campaign staff who coordinated this enormous logistical feat. Your accomplishments were regarded as impossible. You carried me up that glass mountain. You pulled off a miracle. You achieved what all the pundits said could never be done. You have my deepest gratitude, and I'm never going to forget that, not just for what you did for my campaign, but for the sacrifices you made because you love our country. You showed everyone that democracy is still possible here. It continues to survive in the press and in the idealistic human energies that still thrive beneath a canvas of neglect and of official and institutional corruption. 
today I'm here to tell you that I will not let, allow your efforts to go to waste. I'm here to tell you that I will leverage your tremendous accomplishments to serve the ideals that we share, the ideals of peace, of prosperity, of freedom, of health, all the ideals that motivated my campaign. I'm here today to describe the path forward that you have opened with your commitment and with your hard labors. Now, <clears throat> in an honest system, I believe that I would have won the election. In a system that my kind that my father and my uncles thrived in, a system with open debates, with fair primaries, with regularly scheduled debates, with fair primaries, and with a truly independent media untainted by yeah, what about that Trump and Kamala debate? Where about system that? Nonpartisan courts and election boards. Everything would be different. After all, the polls consistently showed me beating each of the other candidates, both in favorability and also in head-to-head -head matchups. But I'm sorry to say that while democracy may still be alive at the grassroots, it has become little more than a slogan for our political institutions, for mm -hmm. our media, and for our government, and most sadly at all for me, the Democratic Party. In the name of saving democracy, the Democratic Party set itself to dismantling it, lacking confidence in its candidate that, that its candidate could win in a fair election at the voting booth. The DNC waged continual legal warfare against both President Trump and myself. Each time that our volunteers turned in those towering boxes of signatures needed to get on the ballot, the DNC dragged us into court, state after state, attempting to erase their work and to subvert the will of the voters who had signed those petitions. I could believe that. It deployed DNC-aligned judges yeah. to throw me and other candidates off the ballot and to throw President Trump in jail. It ran a sham primary that was rigged to prevent any serious challenge to President Biden. Then when a predictably bungled debate performance oh, true. precipitated the palace coup against President Biden, the same shadowy DNC operatives appointed his successor, also without an election. They installed a candidate who was so unpopular with voters that she dropped out in 2020 without winning a single delegate. My uncle and my father both relished debate. They prided themselves on their capacity to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any opponent in the battle over ideas. They would be astonished to learn that. of a Democratic Party presidential nominee who, like Vice President Harris, has not appeared in a single interview or an unscripted encounter with voters for 35 days. This is profoundly undemocratic. How are people to choose when they don't know whom they are choosing, and how can this look to the rest of the world? My father and my uncle were always conscious of America's image abroad because of our nation's role as the template for democracy, the role model for democratic processes, and the leader of the free world. Instead of showing us her substance and character, the DNC and its media organs engineered a surge of popularity for Vice President Harris based upon, well, nothing. No policies, no interviews, no debates, only smoke and mirrors and balloons in a highly Oof. reduced Chicago circus. There in Chicago, a string of You're Democratic right speakers mentioned Donald she has Trump 147 then, though, times to be fair. just on the first day. Oh, who needs a policy when you have Trump to hate? In contrast, at the RNC You're convention, right about President Biden was mentioned only yep. twice in four days. I do interviews every day. Many of you have interviewed me. Anybody who asks gets to interview me. Some days I do as many as 10. President Trump, who actually was nominated and won an election, also does interviews daily. 
How did the Democratic Party choose a candidate that has never done an interview or debate during the entire election cycle? We know the answers. They did it by weaponizing the government agencies. They did it by abandoning democracy. They did it by suing the opposition and by disenfranchising American voters. What most alarms me isn't how the Democratic Party conducts its internal affairs or runs its candidates. What alarms me is the resort to censorship and media control and the weaponization of the federal agencies. When a U.S. president colludes with or outright coerces media companies to censor political speech, it's an attack on our most sacred right of free expression. And that's the very right upon which all of our other constitutional rights rest. He's right. That's President true. President Biden. Yep mocked Vladimir Putin's 88% landslide in the Russian elections, <clears throat> observing that Putin and his party controlled the Russian press and that Putin prevented serious opponents from appearing on the ballot. 88%? So they had to kill 12% of their America, population? The he also prevented opponents from appearing on the ballot. And our television networks expose themselves as Democratic Party. They're the organs. ones that have to go to Ukraine. <laughs> Over the course of more than a year in a campaign where my poll numbers reached at times in the high 20s, the DNC allied mainstream media networks maintain mm -hmm. a near perfect embargo on interviews with me. Mm -hmm. During his 10 month presidential campaign in 1992, Ross Perot gave 34 interviews on mainstream networks. In contrast, during the 16 months since I declared, ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, and CNN combined gave only two live interviews from me. Those networks instead ran a continuous deluge of hit pieces with inaccurate, often vile, pejoratives and defamatory smears. Some of those same well, networks and colluded with the DNC to keep me off the debate stage. Representatives of those networks are in this room right now. And I'll just take a moment to ask you to consider the many ways that your institutions have abdicated this really sacred responsibility, the duty of a free press they have a democracy. responsibility. To challenge always the it's party just called the power. fiduciary responsibility. Instead of maintaining that posture of fear, skepticism toward authority, your institutions have made your made themselves government mouthpieces and stenographers for the organs of power. You didn't alone cause the devolution of American democracy, but you could have prevented it. The Democratic Party's censorship of social media was even more of a naked exercise of executive power. This week, a federal judge, Terry Doty, upheld my injunction against President Biden, calling the White House's censorship project, quote, the most egregious violation of the First Amendment in the history of the United States of America. So far. Doty's previous 155-page decision details how just 37 hours after he took the oath of office. We can do better. Swearing to uphold the Constitution, President Biden and his White House opened up a portal and then invited the CIA, the FBI, CISA, which is a censorship agency. It's, it's the center of the censorship industrial complex. DHS, the IRS, and other agencies to censor me and other political dissidents on social media. What a surprise. Even today, users who try to post my campaign videos to Facebook or YouTube get messages that this content violates community standards. Two days after Judge Doty rendered his decision this week, Facebook was still attaching warning labels to an online petition calling on ABC to include me in the upcoming debate. They said that violates community standards, their community standards. Um, the, the mainstream like media true, was once the guardian of the First Amendment and democratic principles. At least that's the first one I see. And it's joined this systemic attack on democracy. He said YouTube and Facebook. It also 
the media justifies their censorship on the grounds of combating misinformation. Uh, but governments and, and oppressors don't censor lies. They don't fear lies. They fear the truth. That's, and a, that's, good, what that's they a good censor. one. And, that's I, a good and one. I don't want any of this to sound like a personal complaint because it's not. It I, is, but he's um, right. For me, uh, it's, it, it's all part of a journey, and it's a journey that I signed up with. But I need to make these observations because I think they're critical for us doing the thing that we need to do as citizens in a democracy to assess where we are in this country and what our democracy still looks like and the assumptions about U.S. leadership around the globe. And are, are we living up? Are we really still a role model for democracy in this country? Or have we made it you know, a kind of a, a joke? And here's the good news. While well, mainstream outlets denied me a critical platform, they didn't shut down my ideas, which have especially flourished among young voters and independent voters, thanks to the alternative media. Many months ago, I promised the American people that I would withdraw from the race if I became a spoiler. A spoiler is someone who will alter the outcome of the election but has no chance of winning. In my heart, I no longer believe that I have a realistic path to electoral victory in the face of this relentless yeah, systematic expect, censorship Everybody knows that. and media control. But it's not, it's so not I cannot in good conscience ask my staff and volunteers to keep working their long hours or ask my donors to keep giving when I cannot honestly tell them that yeah, he I have a, chance, a real he didn't, path no. to the White House. Furthermore, our polling consistently showed that by staying on the ballot in the battleground states, I would likely hand the election over to the Democrats with whom I disagree on the most existential issues, censorship, war, and chronic disease. Oh, I want everyone to know that I am not terminating my campaign. Okay. I am simply suspending it and not, not ending it. My name, <clears throat> my name will remain on the ballot in most states. If you live in a blue state, you can vote for me without harming or helping President Trump or, or, or Vice President Harris. In red states, the same will apply. I encourage you to vote for me. And if enough of you do vote for me, and neither of the major party candidates win 270 votes, which is quite possible, in fact, Today, our polling shows them tying at 269 to 269. Wait, is he really going to? And I could conceivably still end up in the White House in a contingent election. <laughs> but, I love it. Uh, in oh, man. Battleground states. This is cinema. My presence All right. A spoiler. I'm going to remove my name. And I've already started that process and urge voters not to vote for me. Oh, man. It's with a sense of victory. And not defeat that I'm suspending. Who's the people clapping? The one in the media. Activities. Not only did we do the impossible by collecting a million signatures, the nuclear option. Uh, we yes. changed the national political conversation forever. Chronic disease, free speech, government corruption, breaking our addiction to war have moved to the center of politics. I can say to all who have worked so hard the last year and a half, thank you for a job well done. Three great causes drove me to enter this race in the first place, primarily. And these are the principal causes that persuaded me to leave the Democratic, Democratic Party and, and run as an independent. And now to throw my support to President Trump, the, the causes oh. were free speech, the war in Ukraine, and the war on our children. I've already described some of my personal experiences and struggles with the government's censorship industrial complex. I want to say a word about the Ukraine war. The military industrial complex has provided us with a familiar comic book justification like they do on every war. That this one is a noble effort to stop a supervillain, Vladimir Putin, yep. 
from invading the Ukraine and then to thwart his Hitler-like march across Europe. In fact, tiny Ukraine is a proxy in a geopolitical struggle <clears throat> initiated by the ambitions of the U.S. neocons for American global hegemony. He's not totally I'm not wrong, even though I support Ukraine. Ukraine. He had other options. Yeah. But the, Russia is war, the, the war is Russia's predictable response. Talk about Israel. To the reckless neocon project of extending NATO to encircle Russia, a hostile act. The credulous media rarely explain to Americans that we unilaterally walked away from two intermediate nuclear weapons treaties with Russia and then put nuclear ready Aegis missile systems in Romania and Poland. This is a hostile, hostile act. And, the white, the, uh, and that the Biden White House repeatedly spurned Russia's offer to settle this war peacefully. The Ukraine war began in 2014 when U.S. agencies overthrew the democratically elected government of Ukraine oh. and installed a hand-picked pro-Western government that launched a deadly civil war against ethnic Russians in Ukraine. In 2019, America walked away from a peace treaty, the Minsk Agreement, that had been negotiated between Russia and Ukraine by European nations. And then in April of 2022, we wanted the war. In April of 2022, President Biden sent Boris Johnson to Ukraine to force President Zelensky to tear up a peace agreement that he and the Russians had already signed and the Russians were withdrawing troops from Kiev and Donbass and Lugansk. And that peace agreement would have brought peace to the region and would have allowed Donbass and Lugansk to remain part of Ukraine. President Biden stated that month that this object, that his objective in the war was regime change in Russia. His defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, simultaneously explained that America's purpose in the war was to exhaust the Russian army, to degrade its capacity to fight anywhere else in the world. These objectives, of course, have nothing to do with what they were telling Americans about protecting Ukraine's sovereignty. Ukraine is a victim in this war, and it's a victim of, of the West. Since then, we and of, of Russia and both Russia and the West, since then, we have, since tearing up that agreement, forcing Zelensky to tear the agreement, we've squandered the flower of Ukrainian youth, as many as 600,000 Ukrainian kids and over 100,000 Russian kids, none of whom, all of whom we Let's should take be pretty warning, bro have died. He's going in. And the Ukraine's infrastructure is destroyed. The war has been a disaster for our country as well. We squandered nearly yeah, he $200 billion it out. Yeah. already. And these are badly needed dollars in our communities, suffering communities all over our country. The Nord Stream pipeline sabotage and the sanctions have destroyed Europe's industrial base, which formed the bulwark of U.S. national security. A strong Germany with a strong industry is a much, much stronger deterrent to Russia and a Germany that is, that is deindustrialized and turned into a, just an extension of U.S. military base. We've pushed Russia into a disastrous alliance with China and Iran. We're closer to the brink of nuclear exchange than at any time since 1962. And the neocons and the White a Cuban House don't seem to care at all. Our moral authority and our economy are in shambles. And the war gave rise to the emergence of BRICS, which now threatens to replace the dollar as the global reserve currency. This is a first-class calamity for our country. Judging by her bellicose belligerent speech last night in Chicago, we can assume that President Harris will be an enthusiastic advocate for this and other neocon military adventures. And President Trump says that he will reopen negotiations with President Putin and end the war overnight as soon as he becomes president. This alone would justify my support for his campaign. Last summer, it looked like no candidate was willing to negotiate a quick end to the Ukraine war to tackle chronic disease epidemic, to 
to protect free speech, our constitutional freedoms, to clean corporate influence out of our government, or to defy the neocons and their agenda of endless military adventurism. But now one of the two candidates has adopted these issues as his own to the point where he has asked to enlist me in his administration. Well, Trump. Uh, I'm yeah. speaking, of course, of Donald Trump. Yeah. Less than two hours after President Trump narrowly escaped assassination, Callie Means called me on my cell phone. I was then in Las Vegas. Callie is arguably the leading advocate for food safety, for soil regeneration, and for ending the chronic disease epidemic that is destroying America's health and ruining our economy. Callie has exposed the insidious corruption at the FDA, the NIH, the HHS, and the USDA that has caused the epidemic. Callie had been working on and off for my campaign, advising me on those subjects since the beginning. And those subjects have been my primary focus for the last 20 years. I was delighted when Callie told me that day that he had also been advising President Trump. He told me President Trump was anxious to talk to me about chronic disease and other subjects and to explore avenues of cooperation. He asked if I would take a call from the president. President Trump telephoned me a few minutes later and I met with him the following day. A few weeks later, I met again with shot? President Trump and his family members Jesus. and close advisors in Florida. In a series of long, intense discussions, I was surprised to discover that we are aligned on many key issues. In those meetings, he suggested that we join forces as a unity party. We talked about Abraham Lincoln's team of rivals. That arrangement would allow the us Avengers? to disagree publicly and privately oh, oh and boy. fiercely, if need be, on issues over which we differ, while working together on the existential issues oh upon my God. which we are in concordance. Uh, I was a ferocious critic of many of the policies uh, during his first administration, and, and there are still issues and approaches upon which we continue to have very serious differences. But we are aligned with each other on other key issues like ending the forever wars, ending the childhood disease epidemics, securing the border, protecting freedom of speech, unraveling the corporate capture of our regulatory agencies, getting the U.S. intelligence agencies out of the business of propagandizing and censoring and surveilling Americans and interfering with our elections. Following my first discussion with President Trump, I tried unsuccessfully to open similar discussions with Vice President Harris. Vice President Harris declined to meet or even to speak with me. Well, oh. suspending my candidacy is a hard rending decision for me, but I'm convinced that it's the best hope for ending the Ukraine war and ending the chronic disease epidemic that is eroding our nation's vitality from the inside and for finally protecting free speech. I feel a moral obligation to use this opportunity to save millions of American children above all things. In case some of you don't realize how dire the condition is of our children's health and chronic disease in general, I would urge you to view Dr. Carlson's recent interview with Kelly Means well, and his sister, mad. Dr. Casey Means, who is the top graduate of her class at Stanford Medical School. This is an issue that affects all of us far more directly and urgently than any culture war issue and all the other issues that we obsess on and that are tearing apart our country. This is the most important issue. Therefore, it has the potential to bring us together. So let me share a little bit about why I believe it's so urgent. Today, two thirds, we, we pay, we spend more on healthcare than any country on earth, twice what they pay in Europe. And yet we have the worst health outcomes of any nation in the world. We're about 79th in 
What could Health be the reason for that? Costa Rica, and Nicaragua, and Mongolia, and other countries. Mongolia. Nobody has a chronic disease burden like we have. And what could be the reason? COVID epidemic, we had the highest body count of any country in the world. We had 16% of the COVID deaths, and we only have 4.2% of the world's population. And CDC says that's because we are the sickest people on earth. We have the highest chronic disease rate on earth. And the average American we in a who died nation. from COVID had that's 3.8 right. chronic diseases. So these were people who had immune system collapse, who had mitochondrial dysfunction. And no other country has anything like this. Hamburger Two-thirds Americans. Two-thirds of American adults and children suffer from chronic health issues. 50 years ago, that number was less than 1%. So we've gone from 1% to, uh, to 66%. In America, 74% of Americans are now overweight or obese. Nope. <laughs> and 50% of our children, 120 years ago, when somebody was obese, Here we they, go. Were, uh, they were sent to the circus. They were literally, <laughs> there were case reports done about them. Obesity was almost unknown. In Japan, <laughs> childhood obesity rate is 3% compared to 50% here. Oh, shit. Half of Americans have pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes. When my uncle was president and I was a boy, juvenile oh, diabetes God. was effectively non-existent. A typical pediatrician would see one case of diabetes during his entire career, a 40 or 50 year career. Mm -hmm. Today, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door is diabetic or pre-diabetic. And the mitochondrial disorder that caused diabetes also causing uh, uh, Alzheimer's, which is now classified as diabetes. And it's costing like this country new, more right? than our military yeah, budget new. every year. There's been an explosion of neurological illnesses that I never saw as a kid. ADD, ADHD. Yeah, speech no, that's super new. I think it's like last like three months. Narcolepsy, ASD, Asperger's, autism. In the year 2000, the autism rate was one in 1500. Now autism rates in kids are one in 36, according to CDC. No, nationally. it's one in Nobody's it's one in three. About this. One in every yeah. 22 kids in California has autism. No, I, it's higher. This is a crisis yeah. that 77% of our kids cannot are, are too disabled to serve in the United States military. Yeah. What is happening to our country? He, and why isn't yeah. this in the headlines every single day? He's cooking, There's nobody man. nobody else in the world that is experiencing this. <laughs> He's this cooking. is only happening in America. Oh, About eighteen percent, and by the way, you know, uh, the, the there has been no change in diagnosis, which the industry sometimes likes to say. There has been no change in screening. This is a change in incidence. In my generation, seventy-year-old men, uh, it, the the autism rates are about one in ten thousand. In my kids' generation, one in thirty-four. I'll repeat, in California, 1 in 22. Why are we letting this happen? Why are we allowing we this to happen to our children? No more social These media. These are the most precious assets that we have in this country. How can we let this happen? California, bro. About 18% what is going on in California? of American teens now have fatty liver disease. That's like one out of every five. That disease, Ooh. when I was a kid, only affected late-stage alcoholics who were elderly. Cancer rates are skyrocketing in the young and the old. Young adult cancers are up 79%. One in four American women is on antidepressant medication. 40% of teens, I know some. Have, a mental, teens have a mental health diagnosis. And 15% of high schoolers are on Adderall and half a million children on SSRIs. What percentage of streamers are so on So what's Adderall? causing this suffering? I'll name two culprits. First Social and the worst media. is ultra-processed food. About 70% of American children's diet is ultra-processed. That means industrial manufacturing in a factory. These foods consist primarily of processed sugar, ultra-processed grains, 
and seed oils. Laboratory scientists who form, many of them formerly worked for the cigarette industry, which purchased all the big food companies mm -hmm. in the 1970s and 80s, <clears throat> deployed thousands of scientists to figure out chemicals, new chemicals, to make the food more addictive. And these ingredients the didn't shit. exist 100 years ago. They, humans aren't biologically adapted to eat them. Hundreds of these chemicals yeah. are now banned in Europe, but ubiquitous he, he's, in American No, he writes about this. Yeah, he writes. The second culprit is toxic chemicals in our food, in our medicine, yeah. in our environment. I had no idea about this until like Pesticides, two years ago. food additives, pharmaceutical drugs, and toxic waste permeate every cell of our bodies. The assault on our <clears throat> children's cells and hormones is unrelenting. And name just one problem. Many of these chemicals increase estrogen. Because <laughs> young children are ingesting so many of these hormone disruptors. Oh, America's shit. America's puberty rate is now occurring at age 10 to 13, which is six years earlier than girls were reaching puberty in 1900. Oh, Our man. Our country He's has going the there. puberty rates of any continent on the earth. And no, this isn't because of better nutrition. This is not normal. Breast cancer is also estrogen driven and it now strikes one in eight <clears throat> women. We are mass poisoning boys. all of our children and our adults. See free balling, he, he got teleprompter. Considering the Please. grievous human cause of this tragic epidemic of chronic disease, it seems almost if he free crass balled this, that'd be damage nuts. it does to our economy. Uh, but I'll Imagine say raw dogging it this. is crippling the nation's finances. When my uncle was president of our country, he spent zero dollars on chronic disease. Today, government health care spending is mo the almost is all for chronic disease. And it's double the military budget. And it is the fastest budget, a growing budget item in the federal budget. And chronic disease costs more to the economy as a whole, costs at least $4 trillion, five times our military budget. And, um, and that's a 20% drag on everything we do and everything we aspire to. Poor and minority communities suffer mm -hmm. disproportionately. People who worry about DEI or about you know bigotry of any kind, mm -hmm. this dwarfs anything. We are poisoning the poor. We are po yep. systematically poisoning <laughs> he right. minorities across this country. He's, no, he's Industry right. Industry lobbyists have made sure that most of the food stamp lunch program about don't worry about DEI. Of food We're killing them. <laughs> about Seventy or seventy-seven percent of school lunches are processed foods. Bro, these There's bullet no points are crazy. <laughs> nothing that you would want to eat. We are just poisoning the poor citizens, and that's why they have the highest chronic disease oh uh, burden of anybody, any demographic in our country, and the highest in the world. The same food industry lobbied to make sure that nearly all agricultural subsidies I didn't expect this to go, go so to hard. crops that are the feedstock of processed food industry. This is insane. These policies are destroying small farms, and they're destroying our soils. We give, uh, we give about, I think, eight times as much <coughs> And subsidies to tobacco than we do to fruits and vegetables. What? It makes no sense. What? If we want a healthy country. Hold the up. good news is that we can change all this. We can change it very, very quickly. America can get healthy again. To do that, we need to do three things. The First, exercise. we need to root out the corruption in our health agencies. Second, we need to change incentives in our health care system. And third, we need to inspire Americans to get healthy again. 80% of NIH grants go to people who have conflicts of interest. These, these are the people, virtually everybody who sits, you know, Joe Biden um, just appointed a new panel to NIH to, uh, to decide the food recommendations. And they're all people who are from the industry. They're all people who are from the processed food companies. They're deciding what Americans, you know, here is healthy. And 74% of Americans are obese. Oh. The cost if all of them took their Ozempic 
prescription is three <clears throat> trillion dollars a year. Three this trillion dollars. This is a, a drug that is made by Novo Nordisk, the biggest company in Europe. It's a Danish company, and the Danish government does not recommend it. It recommends change in diet to treat obesity and exercise. That's a good one. And in our country, the that's, recommendation now is for Ozempic to children at age six. That's, oh um, man, that's Nova a good is the biggest company in Europe and virtually its entire value Jesus. is based upon its projections of what it's going to sell, wow. the Ozempic it's going to sell to America. And uh, and we, we have the food lobbyists have a bill in front of Congress today that is backed by the White House, backed by Vice President Harris and President Biden to to allow this He's to be assassinated this $3 for sure trillion dollar cost that is going to bankrupt our country we for a fraction of that amount we could buy organic food for every american family three meals a day and eliminate diabetes altogether we're we're going to bring healthy food back to school lunches oh. we're going to stop subsidizing the worst foods with our agricultural subsidies we're going to get toxic chemicals out of our food. We're going to reform the entire food <clears> system. <throat> and for that, we need new leadership in Washington. Because unfortunately, both the Democrats soda, and the Republican though, right? parties are in cahoots with the big food producers, big pharma, keep and soda. big ag, which are among the DNC's please, major donors. Please, can donors. we keep soda? Vice President Harris has expressed no interest in addressing this issue. Four more years of democratic rule will complete the consolidation of corporate and neocon power. Nope. And our children will be the ones who suffer most. I got involved with chronic disease 20 years ago, not because I chose to or wanted to. It was essentially thrust upon me. It was an issue that should have been central to the environmental movement. I was a central leader at that time. But it was widely ignored by all the institutions, including the NGOs, who should have been protecting our kids against toxins. It was an orphaned issue, and I had a weakness for orphans. I watched generations of children <clears throat> get sicker and sicker. I had 11 siblings, and I had seven kids myself. Jesus, I was Christ. conscious of what was happening in their classrooms and to their friends, and I watched these sick kids, these damaged kids, these fat kids. In that generation, almost all of them are damaged, and nobody in power seemed to care or to even notice. For 19 years, I prayed every morning that God would put me in a position to end this calamity. The chronic disease crisis was one of the primary reasons for my running for president, along with ending the censorship in the Ukraine war. It's the reason I've made the heart-wrenching decision to suspend my campaign and to support President Trump. This decision is agonizing nope. for me because of Damn. the difficulties it causes. He said it. My wife and my children and my friends. But I have the certainty that this is what I've meant to do. And that certainty gives me internal peace, even in storms. If I'm given the chance to fix the chronic disease crisis and reform our food production, I promise that within two years, we will watch chronic disease burden lift dramatically. We will make Americans healthy again. Within four years, America will be a healthy country. We will be stronger, no more, more resilient. People. Or optimistic and fucking happier. get rid of them. I won't fail in doing this. Done. Ultimately, the future, however it happens, is in God's hands and in the hands of the American voters and those of President Trump. If President Trump is elected and honors his word, the vast burden of chronic disease that now demoralizes and bankrupts the country will disappear. This is a spiritual journey for me. Honors his I word. reached my decision through deep prayer, through hard-nosed logic, and I asked myself, what choices must I make to maximize my chances to save America's children and restore national health? I felt that if I refused this opportunity, I would not be able to look myself in the mirror, knowing that I could have saved lives of countless children and reversed this country's chronic disease epidemic. I'm 70 years old. I may have a decade to be effective. I can't imagine that President Harris, a uh, President Harris, would allow me or anyone 
to solve these these dire problems. After eight years of President Harris, any opportunity for me to fix the problem will be out of my reach forever. President Trump has told me that he wants this to be his legacy. I'm choosing to believe that this time he will follow through. His son, his biggest donors, his closest friends, and all support this objective. My joining the uh. Trump campaign will be a difficult sacrifice for my wife and children, but worthwhile if there's even a small chance of, of saving these kids. Ultimately, the only thing that will save our country and our children is if we choose to love our kids more than we hate each other. That's why I launched my campaign to unify America. My dad and uncle made such an enduring mark on the character of our nation. That's a good one. Not so much because of any He's had some really good ones on this. They promoted, but because they he were has. able to inspire profound love for our country and to fortify our sense of ourselves as a national community held together by ideals. They were able to put their love into the intentions and hearts of ordinary Americans and to unify a national populist movement of Americans, blacks and whites, Hispanics, urban and rural Americans, inspired affection and love and high hopes and a culture of kindness that continue to ra radiate among Americans in, from their memory. That's the spirit on which I ran my campaign and that I intend to bring into the campaign of President Trump. Instead of vitriol and polarization, I will appeal to the values that unite us, the goals that we could achieve if only we weren't at each other's throats most unifying theme for all Americans is that we all love our children. If we all unite around that issue now, didn't we just talk about how they were all fat though? We finally give them the protection, the health, and the future that they deserve. Thank you all very much. Man. So uh, let's go ahead. Let's summarize. Uh, RFK. Uh, let's see. No more wars. Uh, put fat people back in circuses. Six-year-olds should not be on Ozempic. I mean, I, I feel like these are some pretty strong points. I do. I, 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 I think he's, I think he's really, <clears throat> I think for a lot of examples, I think he cooked. Now, in my opinion, um, no more cheating. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Right? Uh, healthcare spending, cooking. Yeah. So I think that if RFK had the same voice as uh, Charles Dance, the guy who played Tywin Lannister in Game of Thrones, he'd probably be the fucking president. The guy is so painful to fucking listen to that I don't think that he's going to have a chance of like being president just because making like having to listen to him makes you feel like you need to clear your throat. Like, and, and the voice debuff is massive. It is. It's a massive fucking debuff. But I think that some of the stuff that he said was accurate. And uh, hurt my throat. No, no. And I'm just... Hey, yo, have you heard Kamala? Yeah, it's a lot better than him. It is. It, it is. It is. Like, I, and, and like, again, I'm the kind of person that I will say the dumbest reason and people will be mad. They'll say, you're dumb. I say, I'm not dumb. I just know that other people are dumb. And you are in denial. That's it. And so that's it. Sounds like he's dying. It does. It, it does. And so that's that's the way I see it. That's the way I look at it. Q, let me clear my throat. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it matters. It ma the way you talk and how you act and the way your voice is, 
makes such a big fucking difference. It's insane how big of a fucking difference it is. His voice is just like fucked up because of the way he talks. But I'm saying like it's still a debuff. It's still hard to listen to, right? That's that's really what it is. He used to have normal voice. No, no, it, it's fucked, right? It is. It's fucked. And so that's the way it is. But um, RFK is actually worse than Trump for making shit up, though. He just can't. No, look, look. I, I mean, I'm the kind of person that, like, I don't really ever think, like, this is going to be a weird thing with me, and it's something that gets me in a lot of trouble, but I learned this playing video games, is that if I could find a person that I hated for 10 reasons, but I liked for one, I would figure out a way to use that one reason and ignore the other 10 until I could gain what I wanted out of that person. So, like, I am conditioned to dealing with people that I disagree with, people that I dislike, people that I might not agree with 95% of what they say, but if there's this thing that I can do, a thing that they can do that's beneficial to me, then I'm going to do that. You know? Sociopath holy? It's not being a sociopath. It's being, it's being reasonable. It's being reasonable and... Again, like, if I look at something, my goal is about getting what I want. My, like, I, it's not about the person. I don't think about the person. I'm thinking about the, like, how do I get the thing that I want to have happen? How do I make that happen? That's it. That's the only thing. I'm not thinking about who it is, uh, whose ego it is, who else it helped. Uh-uh, nope. I, I get, yeah, get the loot, get the loot. How can I, what do I need to tell you? It's like, this is why I never get in arguments at a grocery store. It's like a woman gets mad at me at the grocery store. There's an issue. There's a problem uh, that, you know, food orders wrong. What do I need to tell you? What are the words that I need to tell you to make you do what I want you to do? That's it. I'm not thinking about how I feel about it. I'm not thinking about who's right, who's wrong. I'm thinking about how do I get what I want out of this situation in the fastest and easiest way that's as effective as possible. That's it. These are not the droids you're looking for. Right, exactly. And uh, and so that's it. The outcome matters most. As fast as possible. Yep, that's manipulative behavior, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. It's absolutely. I'm manipulating the outcome in a way that's beneficial to me. Uh, that's my primary goal. That's what I want to do. And that is my exact purpose. Yep, you are completely right. Uh, yes, I am. The ends justify the means. Absolutely. And if I have to take an L for it, I'll take an L for it. Uh, there have been a lot of times where I've had to do things that I didn't really want to do. Um, I, I had to deal with things I didn't really want to deal with. But I thought that the outcome of dealing with that was better and it would cause me less friction in the long run. Uh, I, I've taken plenty of L's for things, but because I think it will be the right decision in the long term. Uh, that's it. That's life. Yeah, that's life. And so I think about that with people too. So I can hear somebody say a bunch of dumb shit, and then I hear them say one smart thing, and I say, that's a good idea. He's right about that, right? That's it. Uh, I, I don't have a an attachment to it, to people. Any recent examples? Um... There's actually a really big recent example that I could use, but I can't use it because it's NDA. Um, but it is a, a it's a reason that caused me to lose uh, upwards of six figures. And I thought it would be a better it would be better for more people and it would be better for me in the long run uh, because of that decision. And uh, after looking at the outcome of that decision, it was the right decision. It totally solved the problem. And I came out ahead and I won. That's right. I, it, it's happened many, many times. And it, it, one of the easiest things to do is to allow people to, like, uh, this is the easiest thing to do. To let people's ego win. And it's hard for some people that have an ego, but the moment that you realize and you disconnect yourself from your outcomes, you can let you you can be successful. Like that's it. You make more money uh, hating AOC than accepting their money for it. Game or move? Well, it depends on what happens. You won, but you lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, again, 
uh, there are, like, I, I don't think, I, like, I only think about how do I get to point Z. I don't think about how to get to point B. Like, how do I get to point B, C, or D? I'm thinking about, like, my end goal and how do I reach my end goal. So, I have no problem going backwards sometimes in certain cases because I think that's what's necessary. Sometimes you have to go backwards. Sometimes you have to have L's. Sometimes you have to recalibrate. That's just the way it is. But, like, that doesn't matter because if you're moving towards a goal, then you end up winning no matter what. And that's it. And so, those side quests, well, you, sometimes you do a side quest. But when you do a side quest, you're not always wasting your time. So, so again, I could talk about this for a long time and, uh, you know, get after the rest of this. Do you think it could have gone better looking back? No, it couldn't have. Uh, I, I, there are a lot of situations where I am, in a lot of cases, the only person who can solve a problem. And if I don't solve the problem, the problem doesn't get solved. It has to be me. I have to do it. That's it. And so that that's that's it. And and so like yeah, and and if I have to do that, I have to do that. That's the way it goes. Like growing up, um, I was uh, you know like usually I, like, I don't have any brothers or sisters, but I have a lot of people that grew up around me, uh, that were basically younger brothers primarily, right? Uh, <laughs> few girls here and there, but primarily younger brothers. So I've always been, uh, having to carry people or help people or do things that maybe I didn't necessarily have to do, but it's like, this is just what you need to do, because it's like, you've got to, you know, you got to make sure that they're not, you know, falling behind. And so that's it. No one can help you, uh, but yourself. Um, most people, like, I, I don't really ever, like, there are very few people in my life, you know, it's my dad, maybe like two or three other people in my life that help me, but the reality is that I don't get help from hardly anybody. Almost nobody helps me. Uh, cause they don't, they don't, they can't help me. Like, and, and by the way, I get frustrated sometimes. I think to myself and I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm always helping people and nobody's ever helping me. That's true. And thank God for that. Because imagine being in the opposite position. Thank fucking God. Because the opposite position is not being able to help yourself and relying on other people because you can't do it. So yeah, needing help sucks. It does. Every once in a while I do, but I try to make it as few as possible. But anyway, uh, this, that's about me. So yeah, when I hear this guy talk about something, I don't think about it the way that other people think about it. I don't see it the way that other people see it. And so people might get mad that I'm saying things in a certain way. Um, I, I think this is kind of, uh, I, again, uh, I'm, I'm like not a huge RFK supporter. I'm not a huge hater. I think he says some things I completely agree with. He says some things I, I, I don't really agree with. Uh, but overall, uh, you know, I can respect W's and I can uh, complain about L's. You know what I mean? Look at his tweet below. CNN. There we go. CNN cut away from RFK speech as he was explaining how the DNC rigged the primary. At the palace coup against President Biden, the same shadowy DNC operatives appointed his successor, also without an election. They installed a candidate who was so unpopular with voters that she dropped out in 2020 without winning a single delegate. My uncle and my father both relish debate. They prided themselves on their capacity to go toe to toe with any opponent in the battle over ideas. They're cutting it out. They would We're... be astonished to learn of a Democratic Party presidential nominee who, yeah, like Vice President Harris, has not appeared in a single interview or an unscripted encounter with voters for 35 minutes. We've been days. listening to independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr from Phoenix uh, outlining what uh, led him uh, to his quixotic quest for the White House to now dropping out. Man.